Tick, tock. Tick, tock. Este planeta tiene ocho billones de personas y cada segundo, cada persona está usando energía. This planet has eight billion people, and each and every second, every person is consuming energy. Black. This is a world without energy. This is a world where we are not developing the resources necessary to sustain the lives, let alone the livelihoods, of many people. Energy is central to modern day life. We cannot afford to wait 20 years to finish our schooling. We have to start on it now. Three years ago, when I was 17 years old, I decided to embark on a journey to solve this problem I saw ahead of me. I developed a supercapacitor energy storage device using a novel combination of nanomaterials and nanostructure. This device exhibited much better performance in terms of how much energy it could hold, how fast it could charge, and how stable it was. And for this project, I won the 2013 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, a science competition of 1,600 projects from around the world, and was later named to the Forbes magazine 30 under 30 in energy list. Such energy storage devices have the potential to change the way we look at the future. Imagine being able to charge your cell phone or laptop in a matter of a few minutes. Imagine being able to drive an electric car for hundreds of miles without having to stop and recharge it for a couple of hours. Imagine having a nano battery technology that improves at a rate of 50% a year rather than the current rate of 5 to 8% a year to match the doubling capacity of computer chips. But it's not just limited to these electronics. It goes much more beyond that. There are hundreds of millions of people without access to constant sources of energy. Imagine being able to connect each and every one of those using the grid. Right now, we use energy almost as soon as it is generated. But if we had batteries that could hold the energy for much longer, we'd be able to store the energy when people are not using them and redirect it to when people have to use them a lot. And what about green technologies like solar and wind? Right now, wind comes in many bursts throughout the day. And what batteries have to do is be able to quickly capture that energy and also go through many charge-discharge cycles. So a lot for them to do. And right now, batteries are slow and tired. But if we developed better battery technology for this type of application, we could enable wind and many other green technologies. The possibilities are endless. Batteries are on the learning curve. And this is the energy storage revolution. So this chart behind me shows a couple of conventional electronic battery sources. So batteries, as I'm sure many of you have heard of, can store a lot of energy, but take a really long time to charge. Capacitors, on the other hand, can charge very quickly, but do not store as much energy. In my project, I developed a supercapacitor energy storage device, which falls somewhere between batteries and capacitors. It can hold more energy than capacitors and charge more quickly than batteries. And ideally, we want to be somewhere in that upper right corner of the graph, with something that can hold a lot of energy and charge very quickly. I desired to build this exquisite material come to life. I desired to build this energy storage material that could solve the problems we see today. And I approached this problem chemically from two perspectives. On one hand, I had to find a material that could hold a lot of energy, something that could go through many chemical reactions without breaking down, and something that could be both electrically conductive and conduct electrons, and ionically conductive and conduct ions, two things that unfortunately don't always mix. But it wasn't just the material. We can have a pile of bricks, but it only becomes magical if we can build it into a castle. So I had to find a way to deal with the physical structure of this material, put my new material in a physical structure, and see what happens. And this became my material science form and function problem. Now, I want to take a step back and show you that these material science problems exist everywhere. Many of us have heard of Spider-Man, I'm sure, and Spider-Man seems to defy gravity by scaling up the walls very fast. 
Recently, researchers made these silicone gloves that you can put on your hand, and because they have many different micro wedges or ridges, it forms these difficult, different chemical bonding forces that allow it to scale the wall, just like Spider-Man. So inspired by the gecko, we have spider gecko, but really what they did was they took this material, put it in a form, and got a function. And that is exactly what I had to do. Just like Spider-Man, at each and every step, I had to think about the form and function of my problem. My project title was the design and synthesis of hydrogenated titanium dioxide polyaniline core shell nanorods for flexible high-performance supercapacitors. <laughs> Long title. Long title, but basically what I did was I made this energy storage device using new nanomaterials and a new nanostructure. I took this material, introduced a lot of holes, and made it so that electrons could jump from one place to another, like skipping in the line. And on top of that, I zoomed down to the form of it. I zoomed down to the nanoscale, which is less than a single strand of hair, much thinner than a single strand of hair. And I created a lot of surface area for these electrochemical reactions to happen. And in the process, I got much better properties in terms of how much energy it could hold and how much power it could hold. And that was the project I did in high school. That was the culmination of my scientific efforts as a 17-year-old. And in the process, I learned so much about myself and scientific discovery. And people always ask me, so how did you get involved in energy storage? My answer, a dead cell phone. So how many of you have had a dead cell phone before? Yes? Yes. So unfortunately, I, my cell phone battery dies all the time. And on top of that, it dies at the worst times possible. So I had to get stuck learning how to use a payphone and all these different charging techniques. And that really frustrated me. I got very, very annoyed, and I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something about it. And that's when I realized that I could approach the problem as a scientist with the critical thinking of a scientist and put on that cap and see what happens. Science is natural. We are all born scientists. When you were a baby, you get up, you crawl, you fall down, you pick yourself back up, you tinker your toy, you maneuver, and in the process, you learn how to take your first steps. Science is something innate. It is something human. It is something that each and every one of us does whether it's a businessman who tries out a new strategy and sees the returns on his company, whether it's a dancer who does a new move and watches the audience's reaction in her eyes, whether it's a lawyer who tries out a new piece of logic and wins the case in the process. We all question, we all risk. And for me, going into lab every day was a way to question, to answer these questions I'd always been thinking about. And through this journey, I learned that science is all about the process and not the product. It's not about what gets you from A to B, but rather what gets you from A to Z. So I had to be moved. I had to get from A to Z. I had to do something. I had to feel something. To study hurricanes, we can't just stand there and watch a hurricane. We have to feel the wind blowing in our hair and then only think about the wind currents. To study the effect of the moon on tidal waves, we have to dip our toes in the crashing waters of the ocean and then think about how the moon pulls the waves towards it. To think about energy storage, we have to experience a dead cell phone, get frustrated, and then do something about it. That, and that is exactly what I did. I couldn't just stay in school and read the textbook when I had my broken cell phone next to me. I had to do something, and I transformed my questions into answers by emailing professor after professor to see if I could work in a lab. I heard many, many no's, and if I did hear something, it was often no reply, which is unfortunate, but finally, one professor gave me that opportunity. One professor took it on himself to say, I can mentor a young student. I can mentor this new girl who maybe doesn't know as much as my other students, but I can make this happen. And in the process, I got to the energy storage research I did today. And it was all because I was moved by this problem I saw in front of me. I had to do something. So I entered the lab as a 17-year-old high school student, without a high school diploma, let alone a college degree. I didn't have the experience that many of the others in the lab already had. But that was okay. That was totally okay for me. 
because I was confident that with my willingness to learn and resilience, I could contribute to the field and I could do something about it. As a kid, I was always, always obsessed with the you can do it question. If there was a stove, a burning hot stove, and it said caution hot on it, my immediate reaction, probably not very smart, would be to touch it and often get burned. So really, my parents were not very happy with that. But it was always this obsession with this you can do it question. And it was very stubborn. People told me that you could not work as a 17-year-old high school student in a lab. But I thought I could do it. People told me you cannot fix the energy storage problem. It is too complicated, it is too difficult. But I believed that with a fresh perspective and a new pair of eyes, you could solve it. You could fix the problem in many different, different types of solutions. And I went after it to do exactly that. My journey took me from being a girl with a dead cell phone to someone who wanted to work in a lab to a young researcher working on material science solutions for a new future of energy. So I am really excited, because I know that by expressing the natural that is inside of us, which is the science, we can solve all these problems we see around us. Because I know that with a fresh pair of eyes, we can make the future sustainable. Because I know that with a vibrant personality that dances with the colors of the human emotion, we can transform, we can't do it, till we can do it. I thank you.